Hey guys and welcome back. Uh, in this video we'll be covering about NumPy functions. So if you haven't done, um, if you haven't watched the video on NumPy data structures and operations, um, please watch the previous video. Otherwise we get started. So NumPy comes with uh, a lot of different functions that are really useful, uh, which makes it um, uh, very easy to manipulate data and create data on the get-go. Right. So we're going to look at um, some functions that allows you to create arrays. Uh, we have uh, three um, functions uh, to get started with. So uh, they are zeros, ones, and i. So if you have been working with a matrix data structure before, then all of those data structures are quite uh, useful uh, to get started. So let's uh, have a look at uh, zeros first. Okay, uh, get rid of these. Okay, so we have uh, z equals np dot zeros uh, without the e, uh, funny spelling, but yeah, nevertheless. Uh, and then what you need to do is pass in a list which specifies the size of your zeros. So here for four, four, then uh, inside the z, uh, z variable, we contain uh, all the values that are of value, value zero. So you can... Um, change the dimensions like this and then uh, you can modify the number of rows and columns uh, quite easily okay so zeros uh, and similarly um, ones and i's pretty much do the same thing uh, here uh, instead of zeros so we go ones okay so now zero uh, the z contains ones uh, if we can do i Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, I has to be of uh, a square type, a square matrix with a single value, I4. Okay. So this time it's going to create us a, a square matrix or with I value. Okay. Uh, so do note that um, zeros and ones will take in a, um, a list of two values to specify the rows and columns, but I will take only a single value. Uh, which uh, determines the um, the square size. Okay, so um, in practice, uh, well, we rarely create arrays manually using lists, right? So that's what we have been looking at in the previous video. Um, but if we want elements uh, falling within a specific uh, range of values, then we can use the arrange function. Okay, so this is different to the Python range function. This is a numpy specific arrange function <laughs> um, but the usage is quite similar um, it does specify the beginning and end so array1 equals mp dot a range okay and what we do is specify the number to begin with and the, the number to finish uh, but not including right so array1 will now contain values starting from 2 and by default it will increment values by 1 uh, but of course, if you want to specify different skip values, then you can pass in the third value. Uh, this will specify how much you will skip in between those, right? So array 1, okay, so now we get 2, 4, 6, 8, but not including 9 because um, after 8, it will calculate value 10. And um, obviously, that's not part of it. So we can still go something like uh, 10 here, but array 1 should still contain the same thing because uh, the second uh, parameter is not including, okay? Uh, another really um, useful um, function is to create um, a lin space. Uh, the lin space function will create the number of values evenly spaced from the start value uh, to the end value. So this is actually quite useful and it has a better precision uh, than you trying to do uh, this specific uh, a range uh, uh, using using the a range function. Okay, so array one equals np dot lin space and oh I spelled it wrong lin space. Okay, and basically what you want to do is specify the beginning and the end and what are the increments, right? here 10.0 so uh, using float values is actually quite uh, handy here and I want to increase values by 5 so what this does uh, 
not value by five, but how many points I want to have in this range, right? So I want five points. So array one will have five values. One, two, three, four, five evenly spaced. So this allows you uh, to do something uh, funky, like I want seven values, array one, then it's going to give us um, more precise values starting from this up to the finish and evenly dividing it in between. The good thing about linspace uh, function is it makes sure that your beginning and end values are what you have specified. So it's not going to give you uh, some funny uh, floating value error uh, which you may get if you're trying to use uh, a range function to uh, calculate this. So for example, uh, you want to have a value between uh, one, uh, 0 to 10 uh, in increase of a third. Right, so that's like 3.333. Um, but what end up happening is um, the if you use the orange function, the accumulated value uh, will have some float value errors. So by using the lint space, this will make sure that your beginning value and the ending value will be exactly what you have specified. Okay. So end point. Uh, another note is that the end points are included. Uh, in comparison to the arrange, arrange uh, function, so do not that. Okay, and of course there are some other uh, array functions that you can easily use, and you will see here some of them are quite uh, familiar, like the sum uh, and using the min and max. Uh, but uh, for uh, NumPy to differentiate between the Python min and max functions. Uh, th sometimes they add um, character A in front. Okay, okay. So these uh, functions are um, specific to NumPy, uh, which allows you to um, well do what they specify to do. For example, I want to calculate how many non-zero data there are. Then uh, for this our example array one, there's only one value. So how many values are there in total? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight values in total. So if I count np dot count non-zero of array one, then I should get seven, as we expected, right? And um, np dot oops np dot all is another function associated with np, so I can Check it in array one. It's false. Well, exactly what is it doing? Help np dot all. Then this tells us that uh, where's the description? Okay. So this will evaluate uh, whether the given uh, it tests whether all array elements uh, along the given axis evaluates to true. Um, basically, if uh, because our value uh, array one contains value zero. Uh, it's going to complain that this will evaluate false and therefore um, doing all array is going to give us false. So if we remove that, this will, should give us a true. So let's do that. Uh, instead of zero, let's start from one. Uh, so array one starts from one now. So if we go MP all array one, now it's true because it doesn't contain value zero. Okay, same with sum NP dot sum. Uh, we can pass in array 1. Uh, if we add all those values, it's 84. Uh, we can also find the minimum value and the maximum value using such. Okay, so you can try those as well. So we have seen the basic use of count non zero function before. Basically, what it does is it will count anything that is uh, other than zero. So even the negative value, it will count. But uh, this count non zero function has some additional. Um, functionalities. So not only counting values that are not zero, we can specify some conditions so that it's going to limit uh, the number of counts that it does based on the conditions. So for example, if we want to calculate or count, uh, this is where this array one gets used. If we want to count uh, values that are actually greater than 10, then we can specify this condition in the argument. So let's run this. And our array one will contain our example numbers. Then um, what we want to do is uh, apply this condition uh, inside our count non-zero so that only the values that are greater than 10 should be counted when we do so. 
Okay. Um, so this is um, the Boolean that we're going to uh, specify. So bool equals, uh, oops, bools equals array one greater than or equal to 10. Okay. So this uh, will give us a, a condition that the non-zero will take. So np dot count non-zero. And then we pass in the booleans, bools, okay? And it's gonna give us four. So that means uh, here one, two, uh, three, four values uh, were greater than 10, right? But if we don't provide a condition uh, instead of just the array, then it's going to calculate uh, any values that are actually not zero. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten values. Okay. Uh, rather than creating a Boolean variable, uh, you can uh, just pass in that Boolean expression uh, directly as an argument. Then it's going to give us the same value. Okay. So count non-zero function allows you to actually count um, some specified condition values as well. Uh, so we have seen some examples of any, all, and some before. Um, we can do exactly the same thing here. Is there np dot uh, any? And here, array one uh, is any values in array one greater than thirteen? And this is going to return us false because, as you can inspect here, none of the values are actually greater than 13. But if we do say greater than 10, we do have four occurrences of this. So this is going to return us true. Okay. And uh, NPO, um, if you just pass in the array, then it's going to try to see whether there are any zero values, right? Um, but you can also put condition in here, so so whether it satisfies this condition. So array one is oops, array one is greater than six, and these are all greater than six, so this should return true. However, if we say are they all greater than ten? Well, not all values are greater than ten, and therefore this should return us false. Okay. And using the sum array, as mentioned before, this uh, straightforward, but uh, in addition to Python sum, the numpy array sum does allow you to do conditional sum. So if you want to say add all the values that are greater than 10 in a list uh, using Python, this uh, you, you will have to use some sort of loop to do that. However, uh, using the uh, np array sum, you can specify uh, the condition. So for example, np.sum array one and in here inside the square brackets we can specify the condition so mp dot where array one is greater than or equal to 10 and this is only going to add values together uh, where uh, the values are actually greater than 10 so we had four values that were greater than 10 so these two here and these two down here and you can see the sum will be roughly about 43 44 45 ish right so, and that's what we get here okay uh, we can also do something like greater than six but that's going to accumulate everything if that is the case then we don't really have to specify the where condition and just add it together as well okay so note that here uh, we we are firstly using the np where function to tell uh, which positions have an element larger than 10 so this will reduce uh, or well uh, select values from array one and return us the new um, well the view of array one that meets the uh, condition and then apply the sum function so sum itself doesn't allow you to do conditional um, arguments as such uh, but you can use this uh, where uh, function uh, to retrieve only the values that meets uh, certain criteria so you can see that it doesn't have to be just uh, one boolean you can uh, add some extra conditions in there as well so we'll look at the use of the where function in a couple of slides later. Okay. So as mentioned before, there could be some uh, name conflicts with the built-in Python functions uh, with the uh, np, uh, the numpy uh, functions. So that there are uh, functions like any, all, and some for the Python. Uh, make sure you are calling those num numpy version 
uh, of those functions, for example, np dot uh, any or np dot all np dot sum uh, to ensure that you are using the numpy functions instead of the Python built-in function, which may behave differently uh, as you expect. Okay. So numpy where function. So we just had a brief look at what numpy where function does, right? Um, if you're given a condition, it's going to pick those uh, values for you and return a new array. Um, so uh, we can query numpy arrays to identify records that meet particular conditions using the where function. So let's have a look at an example. So we got uh, some array. I think this is uh, right. Mm. We can probably use um like let's modify array two into array x and then minus one zero. Okay, that should do the trick. So we're going to use array x over there and array x dot uh, np dot where sorry np dot where is the where function belongs to np a numpy and then we're going to pass in array x, which is greater than zero. So in this instance, we want to get rid of minus one and zero and only return four, five, six. So by um, passing in the condition into the where uh, function, what it returns is actually not the value, but uh, the indices of those items that are inside the array. So index two, three, four, five, which is index zero, one, two, three, four, five, so at those indexes, uh, these are values are the one that meets uh, the condition that we have passed in. Okay. So uh, the function where returns a tuple containing an array of indices and data type of the returned array. So we can also check what kind of uh, values they are. And in this instance, they are of type integer. Okay. So let's have a look at more examples. So here, let's create array one equals np dot a range so remember a range if we specify 10 this is going to give us a value from 0 up to 10 but not including so just double check that 0 up to 10 but not including okay and uh, index right so because the where function returns us a bunch of indices um, we're going to get a um, was a tuple Tuple, yes, gets a tuple uh, of those indices np dot where array one equals six. Okay, so what it does is um, it's going to find value six uh, that matches it and gives us a index of that. Okay, but for in this instance, you can see this is going to be six, so let's not do that. Array one equals np dot arrange uh, start from five, go up to fifteen. Okay, so array one now is a different numbers. So now we're going to do the index array one equal equals six again. Then if we go array one of idx, that's the index where the value six is, then it's going to return us that, right? And idx is going to include tuple at index one, so zero, one. And this contains value of type integer 32, okay? Uh, we can also create um, multiple indexes as a tuple idx2 equals np dot where array one is greater than let's say 10 in this instance okay then if you just check idx2 now it's going to have a tuple containing six seven eight nine so those are the indexes of the values that are greater than 10 so we can go array one of idx2 then this is going to give us all those numbers that are actually meeting uh, those conditions. So greater than 10 are 11, 12, 13, and 14. So this way we can um, retrieve the values inside numpy arrays uh, that only meets uh, specific uh, conditions. And of course, you can combine these um, uh, uh, state statements uh, at the same time. So here, instead of uh, putting the idx mp dot where and then we pass in array one is greater than 10. So this will return us uh, the values that are great. So this was the example that we have seen before. Okay. So once we have those indices, uh, we can use them to select exactly those elements uh, that meet our criteria. Okay. 
So basically, we can pass in any of those criteria. This is going to give us all the indexes, and we can pass in this into the data. So this is another example, and it is common to use uh, those code uh, combined rather than putting it onto multiple steps. So you just chuck in there straight away. Okay. So that was the example that we have just seen before. Okay. And we can pass in more complex conditions, as mentioned before, it doesn't have to be a simple conditions. Um, for instance, ask that the square of the number be less than 130. So if we have data, we have data array like this, then I want to get the data values, data of np.where, data to the power of squared is less than 130. Okay, so what this does is np.where data to the power of 2 less than 130 is going to give a, what, what it's going to do is square each value and check whether it's less than 130 or not. Okay, and then it's going to store the indexes where uh, such condition is satisfied. Okay, and then it's going to chuck that uh, indices into this square bracket then it's going to retrieve us all the values that we have. Okay, so here we see 9.3, 10.5, and 8.4 all returned values uh, when they're squared is less than 130, but 11.4, 11.7, and 11.5, also 12.6, they all return uh, values greater than 130 when they're squared, so they are not included uh, in the result set here. Okay, so moving on to uh, modifying multiple items at once. So we have seen previously by indexing um, the numpy arrays, uh, we can also modify or, or apply like a, a matrix to matrix operations or matrix and scalar operations. Um, but we can also um, apply these uh, operations only to specific uh, values that meet uh, conditions. So index positions returned by the where function can be used to filter the array, uh, and these filtered numbers uh, can be applied with specific operations. So let's have a look at the example. Um, so for instance, we could set all items in the following array which are less than 10 to zero. So we have this one here. Uh, uh, data of np dot where where data is less than ten, and what this is going to do is return us uh, two values because those two values are the ones that are less than uh, ten, and then what we can do is okay assign them to values zero. Then what does it do is uh, replace existing value uh, to the value that you have specified. So in this instance, we have converted them to zero. Okay. Um, so this way, what you can do is, what you can do is only selectively modify values uh, based on the conditions that we have. All right. Uh, minima and maxima. Well, it can be useful to find the smallest and largest value in the array. So we can uh, apply the amin or amx um, functions. Um, actually, uh, the NP does provide both amin and min function. In this instance, we will have both of them. So NP dot uh, amx, and then our uh, data. Let's no array one. Okay, um, it's fourteen array one. Uh, the max value is fourteen, right? So NP dot uh, NP does have max as well. Array one. This is going to give us the same value. So actually, they do both are pretty much the same thing. So you can kind of use both of them, but make sure that they are part of the uh, MP um, functions. Okay. And uh, these are only some a few selected functions uh, as part of the statistics, but you can actually do uh, much more uh, using uh, a lot of other functions. So we have seen amin, amax, but as you can see, there's a, a lot more uh, functions that you can use things like the average mean median standard deviation var variance they're all there so you can have a look at the documentations here or you can use the help um, of the np functions uh, in the python shell as well all right 
So we're moving on to reshaping arrays. So reshaping is about uh, changing the dimensions, how they're laid out. So uh, we're going to be using rainfall. Okay, rainfall, check the rainfall. So rainfall is uh, has a three uh, by seven um, data. Uh, so we, you can easily check the, uh, the shape by going uh, your array dot shape okay and since shape is an attribute you don't have to do the brackets okay so it gives us three and seven okay so this means it has three rows with seven columns per row okay and sometimes we will need to reshape uh, some data um, perhaps a sensor provides daily rainfall measures as a single a long one-dimensional array so i want to have all those values uh, appended one next to the other um, and maybe there are some other cases where we might have to re uh, change uh, how those arrays are structured, right? So we can use the reshape method um, and we can get the new shape out of that, okay? So what we can do is, uh, if you don't know or care about uh, the size calculations, um, then what you can do is pass in minus one, then it's going to automatically I just chuck in everything into a single flat uh, values. So rainfall 1D equals NP dot reshape. Okay, and then what we're going to do is put rainfall and minus one. So rainfall 1D, if we look at it, it's going to create a bunch of those numbers all um, created into a flat line. So you can easily go um, uh, uh, rain for 1d dot shape then this is tells us that there are 21 columns uh, for this particular um, array uh, this comma is to specify that this is a tuple of uh, this is a tuple right so this is a one long, uh, one dimension array, which has been wrapped over multiple lines. This in slide, and basically this will be what you'll be seeing when you run it off. Okay. Um, we can uh, get a two dimensional version of the data from one dimensional array. Okay. So this means, uh, I don't know exactly how many rows I have. So minus one is if you don't know, let the program decide. But I want to have seven columns. So you know exactly how many columns you want. You can specify it into the second argument. So what we can do is now rainfall 2D equals uh, np.reshape uh, rainfall 1D. Uh, but in the tuple, what we're going to provide is I want this to be a two dimensional. I don't know how many rows there might be, but I want seven columns. So if we check to rainfall 2D now, it has converted it back into uh, multiple rows and columns where it's specified as seven. And you can easily check rainfall 2D dot shape is three and seven. So it did create three rows uh, uh, with seven columns as well. Okay. So when we ask for a reshape version of the data in an array, are we getting a view of the original data or copied version of it? You can pause the video here and try to modify and see what happens. All right, so let's uh, check it out. So what happens is NumPy will try to give us the view. So that means if it can, it will try to give us the view, which means it's gonna have the same reference to the data set. Uh, but um, as with slice, in some circumstances, uh, it's not able to do so. So sometimes you are, uh, reshaping in a way that those values cannot be uh, next to each other then in such case it's going to make a copy all right so do note that uh, even if you reshape it may not necessarily be a new copy rather it's just a different way of viewing the same data that is stored in the same place all right so uh, often we have to transpose matrices and these can be really uh, done quite easily using the transpose method all right, so let's create uh, some arrays. Uh, let's just use some existing one. Um, 
Maybe this is a good one. Okay, oops. Okay. So now I have array x, uh, which we will transpose. So array x contains, uh, well, let's have a look at the shape. Array x dot shape is four rows and six columns. And what we want to do is transpose this. So array x dot tran, uh, transpose is a function. So we need to provide the brackets. Uh, then it's going to change it. Uh, its orientation by doing that uh, the diagonal flip, right? Or is it this way for you guys? Yeah. So it flips it. So it transposes this um, matrix uh, uh, compared to this one, right? So transpose, very straightforward. You just have to call the transpose um, method. The shorthand for the transpose method is um, the t, dot t, right? So rather than calling it as um, a function, NumPy will automatically create a transpose and store it as the dot t attribute. So array x dot t, it has already created a transpose for you, so you can get the same result as well. Okay, so that's a couple of ways to get the matrix transpose, but this should be uh, quite straightforward to you. All right, so next item is sorting. So uh, in Python, we either used um, list.sort or uh, the built-in sorted function. And um, in NumPy for arrays, it does provide pretty much the same way of doing it. Uh, we'll have the, um, the sort uh, function associated with NumPy, a sort method, a sort function associated with NumPy. However, this sort one, um, typically will perform a bit faster than the built-in Python function uh, because um, these libraries have been optimized for speed as well. Okay, uh, and also uh, you can, if you, ha if you have multiple di multi-dimensional arrays, uh, you can choose which axis you want to sort on, either say by columns or by uh, rows. So let's have a look at sorting examples. So sort is a function part of the NumPy. So we have, we're going to use data for, for this one, np.sort uh, data uh, is going to give us uh, a sorted array, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, right? Um, but do not that it didn't quite give us, well, it didn't update the order in here. Um, so maybe we should go data dot sort, okay? And if we do that, data should now have sorted values, okay? So what this does is, um, if you use the sort data function, it's going to return us a new array of sorted data, but it's not going to change our original data where these numbers have been stored sequentially. So my original data hasn't been changed, but it's just going to give us uh, the new sorted data. Uh, but if you call data.sort, this is acting on the original data. So what it's going to do is sort it and re-update the reference to my new sorted data, okay? So um, do check whether when you call the sort function or the sort method, the output result or the, the suspected result is what you have anticipated. Okay, uh, and if you want to have a, a descending sorted order, so we can go something like negative np dot sort of negative data. Okay, and this will give us the order it backwards. Unfortunately, um, sorting descending order using uh, negative signs uh, will only work uh, with the uh, sort function because we cannot specify a negative value um, as data. So uh, this way we can sort uh, numbers in data backwards, um, but make sure that because we're calling the MP function, you want to save that onto a different variable to keep uh, the sorted values uh, with the reference, okay? Um, so what this does is first uh, convert the signs of the values. So all the positive ones will convert to negative and vice versa. And what it does is 
uh, it sorts those numbers first. So now we have the inverse signed values. And by adding the negative at the front, what it does is um, uh, re-invert the signs. So this way, we're going to have 3 to 1 at the end. So uh, we had 3 to 1. What it, uh, if we had 1 to 3, it becomes negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. If you sort that, uh, it becomes um, uh, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, because negative 3 is smaller than negative 2 and so forth. And then by adding the minus at the front, it gets rid of those signs. So hence, we end up in a, a descending order for this example. So now let's uh, try to sort multidimensional arrays. So for two-dimensional or higher-dimensional arrays, uh, we can specify along which axis of the array sort, uh, the sorting should occur. Um, by default, it's going to, uh, as noted here, going to use negative 1. Um, uh, which means uh, it's going to sort by each row. Okay, uh, so let's create, let's rerun this. So here we have array x. Array x is some mixture values of these guys, and what we can do is um, array x dot sort. And if we don't specify anything, uh, by default uh, the axis is going to be negative one. So if we do that. Array X will contain, uh, it's going to sort each row. So here, if you sort that, it becomes 0, 1, 1, 3, 6, 9. So it becomes 0, 1, 1, 3, 6, 9. Uh, and each row has been sorted in its own space. But if we want to sort based on the values uh, inside uh, the contents, so for example, I want to sort it by uh, the first, uh, the order of each item. So here, I want to have this row first, and then followed by this one, and then followed by this one, and then followed by this one, right? Then we need to specify the sort with a uh, axis equals zero. So negative one is by default uh, sorting it by the rows. Um, by specifying zero, it's going to look at the columns first. Okay, so if we do that, now what we'll see is uh, that it has been sorted based on the content of the rows rather than the rows itself. Okay, so uh, this one is uh, sorting it by um, the rows. Um, negative one is default, but in this one, the dimensions are only two. So if whether it's negative one or one, uh, they're both referring to the same um, axis, which in this case is the row. So axis 0 uh, is going to be column, axis 1 or negative 1 is going to be the row. Uh, and therefore, if we do that, it's just going to sort uh, each row rather than shuffling around the outside. Okay. So the axis is pretty much which dimension we're looking at. If we're starting from 0, the, the further out, outside dimension, and then we go inside by 1, two, three, and so forth. All right, so next item is partitioning arrays. And sometimes we don't necessarily want to sort entire array. That means we only want to sort a small subset. So to obtain these, uh, we could sort the array and obtain a slice of the first few values of the array or, or that specified range. However, uh, this will perform a lot of uh, wasteful sorting uh, of the rest of the items, which you don't really need anymore. Okay, so much quicker than sorting is to use uh, NumPy's partition uh, function. Uh, this takes an, as arguments the array, the number of smallest values we want. Okay, so uh, what we can do is uh, here array p, which is going to be used for partition, um, and np dot Partition. I have some funny indentation in my slide, but don't worry about that. All right, P, and say I want three smallest numbers. Okay. Uh, then what it's going to do is, as you can see, it's not really sorted, but uh, what it does is it's trying to put numbers roughly whereabouts they're supposed to be. So if we just grab the first three numbers, uh, this will ensure that these numbers will be the three smallest values. Okay, uh, if you really want to dig deeper about how these partitioning work, uh, you need to understand about quicksort. And uh, to understand that, 
Uh, you can take the um, data structures and algorithm units to do that. Okay, uh, that's outside the scope uh, of this unit. So uh, as a result, what we get is a uh, some number k where the k smallest values uh, will be returned. So here is the partition of where it gets um, split. And based on this input, the top k will always be that smallest values that we get. Finally, uh, the thing that we want to look at is the save and loading arrays using um, functions. So sometimes you want to store arrays on disk, right? You want to save it as a file and then reuse uh, it uh, later on. So the NumPy does provide a load and save functions. So let's, uh, let us uh, uh, play around with this. So what we can do is we have rainfold up. Uh, rainfall data and let's say we want to save this and use it later on so what we can call is np.save and provi uh, provide the name of this uh, uh, my rainfall data and then rainfall okay so the array that you want to store and when you do that what happens is uh, in the same folder as this file it's going to create uh, .npy file so um, in my same folder as this code here, it would have created my rainfall data dot uh, my rainfall data dot npy file, which means I can load it again, back again equals np dot uh, load my rainfall data dot npy. Okay, just like file handling. Um, but it's quite easy to use this. So back again, it will contain the same array. So this is already converted as the type of uh, NumPy arrays for you. Okay. Uh, you can also save this as a CSV file. So uh, np.save text. You can save it as a text and then go uh, my rainfall.csv. I don't want to override my other rainfall data. And then we can specify rainfall. This is the array that we want to save. And then here you can see the delimiter. This is how you want to separate values between um, each components. Uh, so delimiter uh, equals comma. Okay. So when we do this, what it's going to do is save it as a text file. But essentially what's going on is um, uh, it's creating as a CV, CSV file. So if I open this, uh, okay. so once I load that, uh, this is a CSV file apparently, um, kind of looks like this. Yeah. So you can see that it, uh, it tried to store um, as much precision as possible. Um, so, and each values have been separated by comma, which means if I open this up, in Excel as type CSV, it will put those values in each column nicely for me. Okay, and again, we can um, like again, true equals np.load text, um, and then we can load uh, my rainfall.csv, and you have to specify the delimiter. Delimiter equals um, comma. We separate each value using comma. Okay. And because this has multiple uh, columns, this will automatically oh, back again to put it into nicely into multi-dimensional array. Okay, so that's it for this video. Wow, it did take quite a long, um, but hopefully my editing skills have chopped it down quite a lot. Yeah, otherwise, I'll see you in the next video. Bye bye.